So I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are more valuable than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. This is God's word. So I entitled this, and I'm actually going to switch to my, run the slides on my phone so I can show you, because I need my sermon notes on here. Um, I entitled this, um, sorry, hang on a second. I, I titled this HDMI, yeah. Perfect. There we go. Switch over. Okay. Technology. This is where sometimes just having a piece of paper would be nice. Okay. Um, so I titled this Faithful and Fearful Acknowledgement. And I hope you'll kind of realize this, what I mean by fearful acknowledgement, even though the text seems to imply that we shouldn't be afraid. Um, but when you think of fears or phobias, like what are the, some of the first things that come to mind? Like public speaking. Um, I know for a while public speaking was up there, fear of death, snakes, um, uh, you know, spiders, um, heights, roaches, okay, things like that, sharks. And those are all like pretty reasonable, common things that we're afraid of. <coughs> But those are all wrong, actually. They don't even make the top 10 list. So this, this is kind of blurry, but you can't really see it. But I'll, tr I'll try and read the, um, the stats for you. Um, but this was a study done by Chapman University. They have a, a wing on a study of American fears. And so this is for the United States. And this was 2024. Um, and so what topped the list of people's most, the things they're most afraid of is corrupt government officials, 65%. And pretty much, if you go down the list and you kind of look through, it's most of the stuff is actually related to um, government. It's related to some external force. You have the world wars in there. Uh, you have nuclear war, terrorist attacks, biological warfare, things like that. And there's only a few that have to do with even death, which is pretty incredible. And what's really interesting is that pretty much this has topped the list for like the last 10 years or something like that, where this fear of government failure has been, or fear of government corruption has been something that people have been afraid of for many, many, many years. And the other, uh, there's another interesting thing here is that when it comes to even just the election, and this is really fascinating, that it's, it's staggering that regardless of political affiliation, whether you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, everyone is afraid. That's the bottom line. Everyone has a fear when it comes to the election outcome. So this is for 2024. And then there's another study done in 2023, so last year, by LifeWay Research. And they found that 7 in 10 Protestant pastors believe that there's a growing sense of fear within their congregation about the future of the nation and the world. Additionally, more than three in five say their churches have a similar increasing dread, specifically about the future of Christianity in the U.S. and around the world. And, and so clearly fear is a, is a, it's a major thing for us. It is basic to being human, right? Everyone is, has fear. Even animals have a sense of an instinctive fear, and it's natural and I think God-given because it keeps us from do, it keeps us from harm. It keeps us from doing things we shouldn't. Um, it protects us. 
Yet throughout the Bible, we see that examples, after, like example after example of, of God's people continuing to give in to fear, and then God calling them to be courageous and trust in him. I mean, just that phrase, uh, do not fear or, or don't be afraid, appears many, many times throughout the Bible. And God calling them back to trust in his power, that he can deliver them from situations. And yet we see that those people fall back into the same patterns of fear and distrust of, of God. They, they repeat the pattern of disobedience. And all this is to say, you should be afraid. Be afraid, but be afraid and put your fear into God. Put your fear in the right place. And Jesus, in our passage, he tells his disciples what to fear. So the issue that they had was that their fear was in the wrong place. And it prevented them from living out the mission that God was ultimately calling them to, which is to make disciples. Because if you fear and truly fear God, then you're entrusting your whole life to him. His perfect plan and will for your life. The passage is not just purely about fear, but it's also about ultimately how we are a witness or how we acknowledge Jesus as Savior and Lord in our life. And so before we get there, let's pray, and then um, we'll kind of move through the text. So God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the clarity of it and the fact that you don't leave us without wisdom. You don't leave, leave us without knowledge and direction. But God, we we need the power of your spirit to open our minds and our hearts to the truth of it, that it would change us. And so, so Holy Spirit, would you do that? Would you uh, cut into the depths of our hearts that your word would transform us into the people that you are calling us to be in the name of Jesus. Amen. So first I'm going to look and I'm just going to keep the scripture up here. Um, so, Oh, Wrong scripture. Thank you. Let's get back to there. Um, so last week I know I went like full slides, and this week I'm going full manuscript. So stay with me here. Um, okay, there we go. So the scripture's up there. So misdirected fear for this section. So Jesus begins, and he, and, and he says, my friends, which I think is the first time that Jesus even mentions friends. And if you actually, if you have another Bible, it might be easier to see. But he says, my friends. And so he, he's meeting his disciples in a very familial sense here. But he imperatively tells them not to fear. And as I already mentioned throughout the Bible, God commands his followers not to fear whatever they're afraid of. And in this situation, Jesus is commanding them not to fear those who can kill the body, um, but then afterward they can't do anything, as he says. And so he's saying, don't fear these, these ones that can kill your body, but do nothing to your soul. And so in other words, their reach is limited. The scope of what they can do to you is limited. And this begs the question as to who Jesus' the disciples would naturally fear. I mean, they, of course, they would have uh, feared the religious authorities and the political authorities. We know that historically, Palestine in this time was under Roman rule. Like, they didn't have the sovereignty that they once did with the other Israel kings, like when they had David and Solomon on the throne. And so they have Rome that's over top of them, ruled by governors. But generally, Rome was cool with them as long as they paid their taxes, which of course every government loves, and that they pretty much didn't cause any riots and divisions, which of course every government also loves. But nonetheless, they kind of operated independently of Rome, as long as they kind of kept those things. But nevertheless, we see that the empire and Jewish leaders, they would elicit fear. Right? Rome, they worshipped the empire. Their god was the, the emperor. And for, of course, the Jews, they worshipped Yahweh, the one true God. And, of course, we're going to see this. We see through Scripture the challenge of Jesus as the Messiah. And from the moment of Jesus' birth, it was already a threat. Herod wanted to eradicate Jesus, King Herod at the time. 
And as we've seen thus far in Luke, the Jewish leaders have been trying to take Jesus down. They've, even in just the last passage, the last text, right at the very end, it talks about how th- they were trying to catch Jesus in something he might say so they can accuse him. They're lying in wait, it says. And, but at this point in Luke's account, generally Jesus has spoken prophetically. He's already talked about how the Son of Man is going to suffer, but we haven't seen any real actionable persecution. We haven't seen them necessarily dragged into any synagogues. It's Jesus is, is speaking very much in a future context. And we know that he's going to suffer. Of course, we know this. But for the disciples, they're only hearing about it. In verse 11, he warns the disciples that they will eventually suffer at the hands of rulers and authorities, that they'll be dragged in before them in the synagogues. And we know that, of course, that for, the, for all of us that are familiar with this story, that when Jesus is arrested and, and crucified, the disciples, they largely scatter. You know, Peter denies Jesus three times. And, you know, throughout the book of Acts, Luke records a persecution that will come for the followers of Jesus. And of course, from that first century church all the way up until now, Christians somewhere in the world, even now, are persecuted because they acknowledge Jesus Christ, simply because they acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. And so Jesus is warning them to to not put their fear in the wrong place. And so that means that there must be a right place for our fear. And so second, second point. So fear the one. So Jesus says, Not to fear the ones who can only kill the body, but to fear the one who can throw you into hell. What does Jesus mean here? So Jesus isn't saying don't fear. This isn't like a kind of a, you know, happy-go-lucky, just, you know, all good vibes, don't fear anything, just kind of go with the flow. He's saying put your fear in the right place. Redirect it to the one who ultimately has control of your life and your destiny was control over your whole being. And then, like his command to not fear, Jesus also imperatively says to fear the one. I kind of thought about this um, illustration or um, way to think about this better. There's a difference between like a mall cop or like a security guard uh, and like an actual uniformed, commissioned police officer, right? The, uh, a mall cop or, or security guard, they have really limited ability, right? Like they can do some stuff, um, but they can't, they can't arrest you. They can't take you to jail. They might be able to instill some fear. They're, they're more than just a regular Joe Schmo citizen, but they're not going to ultimately take you to jail. And yet a real cop, of course, has the power to arrest you and, you know, detain you, arrest you and take you to jail. And so what Jesus is saying is, don't fear the one who has this very limited capability and who can do nothing after, aka that would be like a mall cop, but fear the one who actually has authority and the ability to, to has control over you beyond just this moment in time. And so who's the one who has authority to cast into hell? Well, the answer is God. We know that, that vengeance is God's that God has the right to justice. And I think the, the, the fear of the Lord is, it's a much larger topic, of course, than I can even cover here. But the, for the sake just of our text, I think when you think of the fear of God, it's not like a scary, like a Pennywise type of fear or like a phobia, like a fear of something gross, like a cockroach or something like that. But rather, it's a reverence. It's a awe because God is holy and He's He's glorious. Like back when I was in high school, I went to a, I was a for a few years. I was in a small uh, liberal arts school, and so uh, we, you know, the class sizes were pretty much like this size. And you know, the professor, everyone knew the professors, and we got this new headmaster. And I remember that, you know, we he came in and he just. The way he carried himself elicited a response from all of us. And I remember one of our professors who was, had been with the school for a really long time, really um, brilliant man, very capable teacher, saying that he was nervous for the new headmaster to kind of sit in on his class. And it's not because the guy was, was scary necessarily, but it's because he, his, who he was, his capabilities, the fact that he was headmaster, it, it, it 
elicited a certain response, a sort of reverence, right? Think of the type of reverence you might have for, you know, uh, um, the president or, you know, the commander of the army, army something like that. And, that. and that's the point that we're trying, that, that's the, the idea of the fear of the Lord. It's a healthy fear. It's something that we are supposed to have. We give this fear to human beings, but God is saying that he deserves that. And, and he deserves it first. Now to the idea of hell, this, the, um, the, the hell here that Jesus talks about, it's, it's really boils down to God's justice against sin. It's just, it's his justice against evil and wrongdoing. Right? Disbelief and distrust is sinful. You see that Israel, the wilderness, their, their years throughout the wilderness, they disbelieved God. They didn't trust him fully, that he would provide for them the manna, that he would win war and battle for them, that he would provide them with drinking water. They didn't trust him. And what it led to was their, they, didn't, they weren't welcomed into the promised land, and they ended up dying in the wilderness. So there was consequence for them was death. And, and this idea of hell is Gehenna, which is, which is a literal translation, is just this trash dump that was outside of Jerusalem at the time. And, and it's an inescapable place. The imagery for these, the, the people who are hearing this, Jesus say this, what would come to mind is an inescapable place. It denotes a, a total annihilation of literally anything thrown into it. In other words, God's justice, his judgment against wrongdoing, it can't be thwarted. You can't get out of it. There's no way to escape it, in other words. And so God has con- ultimate control over your destiny, not in a malevolent way, but in a benevolent way, in a good way. And Jesus says that you're more cared for and more valued by God than even the sparrows. And yet the sparrows are cared for, he talks about. Something so lowly and insignificant as a bird, which he says is sold for just a few, uh, few pennies at the marketplace, God provides and makes sure that they have something to eat. And yet he says, you're more valuable than they are. And so how much more is God going to care about you? This is kind of reminiscent of Psalm 139, where David proclaims, he says, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. He says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. And this doesn't mean that life isn't going to be challenging. And we shouldn't be surprised when it is, when it's hard, and when things bad happen to us, when we suffer. The, the, the context of Psalm 39 is that God is, he's always near, no matter how life, how dark life gets. He, David says that if, if he even descends to death or Sheol, the lowest, lowest, lowest place ever, that he's, God is still there. He's still near to him. And so there's nowhere we can get away from him, height or depth. And we know David's life, of course, was marked by up and downs. Like he was hunted down by King Saul. And he also committed some really heinous sins himself, and yet God never abandons him. God cares for him. And so we're to fear God because he ultimately has control over our life. But we fear him with reverence because he's good and because he cares for us and because he values us. And so this moves into the next point, that God empowers us with his Holy Spirit. So we, the Bible talks about the spirit as a helper. And he's given us this spirit to believers in order to help us live faithfully. And so apologetics is, is good, and I love apologetics, and learning arguments and things like that, those are all really good and essential for us. But at the end of the day, our real strength ultimately comes from the Holy Spirit and relying on the power of the Holy Spirit as we acknowledge Christ before others. And it requires this trust. 
Like notice that Jesus says the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour. In other words, he's going to teach you in that moment. So there's no script that you get to take into, you know, potential conversation. And we know every conversation is different. When you have, if you've you know, every time you talk to someone who maybe doesn't share the same faith, there's, there's a different angle to it. it might, the, the setting might be different. The people are going to be different. They have different experiences. There's, you have no control, in a sense, over how that conversation could go. I mean, I've had those types of conversations with people over a coffee or a random run-in run and had that conversation with someone at a bar in, you know, at, for a happy hour you know, after work. It just doesn't matter. It can happen in any place. And yet we're, we're promised that the Holy Spirit is there to give us the words to say, as Jesus says. And so we are to expect the Holy Spirit to empower us in every situation and in every conversation. And not to rely on fear or to, to resolve to what we feel like is the most comfortable thing to do, but to, to, to step out a little bit and have the awkward conversation, trusting that God's going to give us the right thing to say and to shut our mouth to say maybe to, do, to not say something we probably shouldn't say. And so I, tend, I, I, I try to look at every conversation, potential conversation, as a gift or an opportunity to, to talk about the hope that we have. I love how Peter talks about this. He says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. If you have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. And remember that Peter is in our text. So this, this same writing here that I'm reading to you, Peter was hearing these words directly from Jesus. He walked with Jesus. Denied Jesus. So Peter continues, Honor Christ as the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. And so all of this is necessary to, to do what? To, it's necessary to acknowledge Jesus as Lord to the ends of the earth despite the potential of hostility. Because this is the context that Jesus is saying, that there will be hostility. So next point, acknowledging Jesus. In verse 8, Jesus says, I tell you, everyone who acknowledge, acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. So this acknowledgement assumes it will be public in some form. So this isn't like whispering under your breath or you know, just kind of keeping your faith to yourself. He's assuming that there will be a place and a time where you'll need to make public verbally to others or written your, your association with Jesus of Nazareth. Daryl Bach, a commentator I've been using throughout this Luke study, he, he writes, the real issue is that the disciples' ability to express commitment to Jesus before other people. So Jesus makes it clear that th th this, this won't be without a threat. There's going to be a threat to their acknowledgement of him. They're going to be dragged into the synagogues. The rulers and authorities are going to go after you. And, and what are you going to say, in other words? I, remember, I, I still see this from time to time, but I remember first seeing it back in, way back in the day when you know, email was like really new and the, the big new thing. And, and people used to circulate this one email, and maybe you've gotten there, you've seen it, um, which is like, basically quoting from this was like, um, Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before man, then I'll ignore, you know, acknowledge you before the angels. But if you don't, then I won't acknowledge you. So like and share this on Facebook. You know, in other words, it's, it's trying to say, if you don't share this with 10 people or 10 of your friends, you know, you don't email this to 10 people or you don't share it on Facebook, then you're not actually acknowledging Jesus. That, you know, that was kind of the point of the, the post. And of course, it, it's silly because... Um, because it's just, that's just not true, and it's just a bad interpretation of this text. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. He, he isn't saying just simply tell someone you're a Christian. That's not, that's not what he's saying. There's more gravity to it. 
He's talking about being under the threat of persecution and you still following through. Like, will you stick with Jesus when things get tough, in other words? Will you, will you acknowledge Jesus at the cost and the expense of your own well-being and potentially the risk of your life? Not whether someone will dislike your post on Facebook, but will it cost you something? Will it really cost you something in your life? Matthew 26, this is what Jesus says. And when they had sung a hymn, they went up to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have raised, after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And then Peter answered, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must, den- must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. Peter's passion is admirable, but we know that he, he did. Right? Jesus isn't wrong. Jesus doesn't lie. He did deny Jesus three times when he was pressed by strangers after Jesus' arrest. When people are asking, are you with that man? Are you associated with that man? No, no way, Peter says. And so this is a warning to the disciples who will experience persecution and, and who might be tempted to give up the faith. As Jesus says here in verse 10, everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. There's an assumption that there, that there could be a denial, or there's a temptation of denial of Jesus. And so we come to this very tricky verse, which when I was a kid really scared me, which was the unforgivable sin, as, as I knew it as a kid, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And what on earth does that mean? I think we have to look within the scope of Jesus' whole ministry, I think, in the Bible to really understand this. And so I'm not going to go into depth on this because I think that it deserves its own topic. But to help us make sense of it within this passage, why is the rejection of Jesus forgivable, but the rejection of the Holy Spirit, or the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, unforgivable? Well, this passage and the parallel passages in Matthew and Luke, it's the only place in the Bible that mentions an unforgivable sin. In the scriptures, we know, say that Jesus is going to be reviled. The Old Testament talks about it. That the, the son of man, the, the suffering servant, he's going to be persecuted. He's going to be rejected and ultimately killed. It's part of the suffering that comes with that rule. And we know that when Jesus ascends to heaven, he sends his Holy Spirit, Acts 2. And, and, and so blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is this deliberate and continual rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. It's a product of a, a hardened and unrepentant heart. Bach, that commentator, again, he puts it really well, much better than I can. He says, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not so much an act of rejection as it is a persistent and divisive rejection of the Spirit's message and work concerning Jesus. When a person obstinately rejects and fixedly refuses the message, that message or evidence, that person is not forgiven. So Marshall sees it as a, a warning to opponents not to deny the Spirit's work and argues that this text deals with apostasy, or, or, or previous text deals with apostasy, while verses a, a 10 through 12 deals with an outsider. Nolan says that, says it well. He says, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the denial or rejection of, of the manifest saving intervention of God on behalf of his people. The one who hardens himself or herself against what God is doing as he acts to save, um, sorry, sorry, the one who hardens himself or herself against what God is doing um, as he acts to save places himself or herself beyond the reach of God's present disposition of eschatological forgiveness. So in other words, to sum um, all of that up, in other words, the blasphemy, this sin, is a rejection of the saving message of Christ. And so to continually reject that message, to die in that, is saying there's no second chances after you die. 
you've, you've rejected this message your entire life. There's no second chances after that. And so to deliberately reject the Holy Spirit, that is the unforgivable sin that he's talking about. And we know that this spirit is, is, the, is what produces the salvation in us. As Titus says that when the goodness and loving kindness of our God and Savior appeared, he saved us not because of our works done in our righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So the work of the Holy Spirit within our life, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's what we talk about at least in the Reformed camp or world, about this idea of regeneration, that the Holy Spirit is what removes our heart of stone and turns it to a heart of flesh and, and allows us to accept the truth. It allows us to accept the message of salvation. And so to, to, to not to reject the Holy Spirit's work then is to remain in an unforgivable sense. To remain unforgivable. Of course, we know that Peter, he denied Jesus, and yet, despite the fact that he rejected him, he was forgiven. He became a force for the gospel, as Acts shows us. And, and the Spirit removed the, the scales from the Apostle Paul's eyes. Someone who persecuted Jesus in the church before his conversion. And there's so many others that fall in this boat. And Jesus doesn't leave the disciples alone, but he gives us this Holy Spirit in this moment, in this work of acknowledgement. And the same spirit that is living and active in us was the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, as, as the, the Bible says. The same spirit that conquered death gives us the words and the ability to speak. And so don't be anxious. Don't be afraid, but trust in this power that God has given us. And so last point. What's our, what's our threat? Because if we're honest, and I think we kind of, many of us know this, that we don't live in the same context as the disciples, and we enjoy these freedoms in America. That in the United States, that we, we don't have to, there's not the same risk of persecution, that if we say we're a believer, that something's going to happen to us. We aren't in that same situation. But that being said, the disciples fully didn't really understand the mission of the Son. They were in somewhat of an ignorance at the time. They, they anticipated that the, the Son of Man, the Christ, was going to be victorious over Israel's enemies. Despite the fact that, of course, Jesus said it over and over and over again that he was going to suffer and he was going to die. They still didn't get it until the resurrection. And for me, personally, I, mean, I admit that sometimes I'm, I'm more concerned with what people think of me than I am fearing God and what God thinks of me or my love for God or what he's called me to. And so I, I can sometimes have this cowardly tendency to conceal my faith among unbelievers. And I think the root of that fear is really just a concern of what people think of me. Will people think I'm weird? Will they think I'm on the wrong side of history? You know, um, what will they think of me? Do I, do I, do I just want to avoid an awkward you know, conversation? And I've had many, many of those. And yet the, the thing is that I've yet to have a conversation, I've yet to be in a situation where I was actually persecuted because of something I believed. Maybe, a, oh, that's interesting, you know, or I don't believe that. Um, but never, never a type of persecution. But I know that in, in, in the world, people do. There's people right now in the world somewhere that will be persecuted for it. And so we are in somewhat of a different situation in America because of our freedoms. And to be honest, I don't know if that will change. And it might change. We might come, there might be a time in, in our lifetime in America where that's not the case. Yet the message is the same. Will you stick with Jesus despite the hostility? Will you stick with him when things are tough? And so just a few things as I've thought about it. Maybe some things that are that threat of death for us. I think like relationships, that there, there's a potential for social alienation or a, you know, a loss of friends because of the faith that we might proclaim among certain people. 
to be friends or family or, or co-workers. I think alignment, that, we, that we're going to be different on, on certain issues, cultural issues, social issues. We're going to be different, and we're not going to align perfect, perfectly. And, and people will view us as being on the wrong side of history as a result of that. And that might bring in some of that social alienation. I think recognition, like the idea of being seen as you know, cool or respectable. Some people are just cool. Like, I think Dave is just cool. Um, but other people just aren't, like me. No matter how hard I try, you know, you want to look cool. You're just not. But recognition, it's not something that comes with the, the at least in the, eye, the, 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 the eyes of the world, it's not something that necessarily comes with us. You know, power, we're told to give up our power. Status, being associated with the least of these. Pleasure, not not getting to do everything we want, not getting to live the way we want. Wealth, you know, being called to, to be generous, to give up our, our resources and our money. And so what I, I would encourage you just to, to take inventory of what, what those things might be for you, those fears for you this week. And, and maybe you're really good with public evangelism and you're out there and you're caving on the street and, that, and that's, that's really great. And God has certainly empowered certain people to do that, but maybe then think of what area of your Christian life, of those maybe th things that I listed out, do you fear doing or not doing because you don't have the right trust in God? And so the, the, the fear of man, is, it's, it can be a deterrent then to our faithful witness. And the result, Jesus says, is, is death. But fear of God is the solution to this fear of man. The result is eternal life, even though right now it might seem like death. And the Spirit is our enabling power to help us witness. You see, when you look at Jesus, like he, he faced terror prior to his crucifixion, as we know. He was rejected by those closest to him. He was rejected by everyone, as he says, that they all scattered. He experienced the emotional and excruciating pain of his loss of relationship with God the Father and the physical pain of the cross. He gave up his spirit on the cross so that we would have his Holy Spirit. And he died, ultimately, taking hell upon himself, in a sense, so that we wouldn't have to go there. He was perfectly obedient to the mission of redemption. And ultimately, Jesus, he's, he's experienced every fear that we have, whatever the fear is when it comes to talking about our faith or evangelizing or living the Christian life. Jesus has experienced those. And yet Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven, and we know that he reigns victoriously. And so whatever befalls us, whatever happens to us in this life, as we faithfully acknowledge Jesus, our hope is ultimately in the lordship of Jesus. Our comfort is in the care and the goodness of our heavenly Father, who we know values us more than all of creation, and our strength is in the Holy Spirit. So let's pray. So God, thank you again for your word. Lord, we ask that your spirit would just move powerfully within us. Help us to get out of the way so that your spirit can do the work that you want to do. God, help us to live fearful of you so that we're effective in our witness of you, that we're, we're effective in acknowledging you as our Savior and as our Lord. God, help us not to be fearful of the world, the government. When we think about as the election approaches, that we wouldn't be caught up in that. 
but that we would trust ultimately in you and your care for us, your goodness. And that ultimately, God, that you paid the ultimate price, the, the thing that we deserve, the things that we're incapable of doing, Lord, you already, you took it upon yourself. And you just ask us to be faithful to living that out. And so Jesus, help us by your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen.